Hi everyone, welcome to my video on traumatic stress, the great pretender, understanding your neurobiology before it's too late. Oh, okay. Just my first time really using this on my computer, so apologies in advance if there's a little bit of hiccups here and there. So the research for my lecture today comes from, most of the information has been extrapolated from the book, The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. If you haven't read it, I highly advise it. It seriously enhanced my knowledge of traumatic stress and healing exponentially. Um, in addition, the research also comes from my certification in traumatic stress, which I completed via the International Academy of Traumatology, and my work with the Veterinary Confessionals Project, which the website, you can click the link below to see more about and learn more about if you already don't know about it. And then really... This lecture is about extrapolating a lot of this information that isn't really out there. I mean, is out there for the human medicine field, for education, for war veterans, for basically like everyone else except for veterinary professionals. So my attempt in this lecture is to try and shed more light onto what we deal with on a regular basis in our profession when it relates to traumatic stress. But it's also so much more than that. This is just one small, or I shouldn't say small, one big important topic uh, among many others. And most people don't still know our professional struggles. Even the experts don't realize how much veterinary professionals struggle. So, um, Hopefully, people will ta start talking about it more, and this video and this lecture is my attempt to try and make that happen. So thanks for tuning in. So I call it the Great Pretender, oops, sorry, because it traumatic stress, I'm just nerdy like that, but also traumatic stress tends to appear like something else. And it can be very confusing because it actually runs rampant throughout our profession and we largely focus on symptoms like compassion fatigue and burnout, even suicide, which can actually be end stages of the traumatic stress uh, process, especially if there has been no processing of the trauma which I'll get more into, so don't worry if some of the things are not clear right now. And as we go through our day-to-day -day jobs and appointments and whatnot, we aren't actually actively practicing with awareness of that fact that traumatic stress runs rampant throughout our profession. And how can we really solve this problem if we don't truly understand it? Over the years, people have been trying to bring more awareness um, to how many people are leaving the vet field, how many people who are in the vet field commit suicide, but it's just not enough. We need to do more. We need to truly take the time to understand what we're dealing with so we can be better equipped to handle it. That's really what this is all about. Okay, moving on to the next slide. <laughs> Having so okay, there we go. So just briefly, our learning objectives. This will also be listed, um, but we want to differentiate between primary and secondary traumatic stress. We want to look at how it manifests in our profession. Um, articulate current theories about how it relates to compassion fatigue and recognize traumatic stress and the effects on our nervous system. 
we also will make a plan, or at least I'll give you the beginnings of making a plan so you can utilize resources and make your own plan for resiliency. So it's not all bad news, guys. <laughs> and then what you need to do to create and maintain your self-care plan. And of course, poople snoot. I, that's just a funny word that I use to try and have some fun and put a smile on your face and also my face and not take myself too seriously because some of the stuff can get really heavy and intense and it's just important to remember to stop and take a breath and remember that there is still joy in the world. And also trigger warnings are really important here. If you are someone who knows you have PTSD, SCSD, um, any form of like trauma related mental health disorder, you just might want to be aware before you watch the video. I am not giving any medical advice. I am not assuming to know or treat anyone in these lectures. They're purely educational, purely for your viewing and understanding. And even if you do feel some negative feelings come up and you're triggered, just remember triggers can be positive or negative. And they can also lead to light bulb moments that help you understand more about yourself. So instead of being afraid of the emotion when it comes up, maybe just take a pen and paper, jot it down, maybe take a break, pause the video, um, go get some fresh air, something like that, come back to it. You don't have to watch the whole thing through all at once. So keep that in mind and write anything, no matter how small it may seem, if it kind of sets a like, oh, that's interesting thought in your head, might want to write it down. That's all I'm saying. And remember that support resources also exist outside of yourself, that you don't need to go through things alone. Um, the most difficult thing sometimes to do is to ask for help when you're struggling. And so I just want to make sure that you guys know these services exist, especially here in Colorado. We have the Colorado Crisis Services, which you can even just text to. You don't have to call. Um, and just remember, deep breaths help relax your nervous system. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, just take a couple deep breaths. Close your eyes. Become centered. Or turn the video off and move on with your life. <laughs> um, so personally, I highly recommend using as much support as you need. There's no such thing as too much support. And this is a confession from one of our conferences where I put up the vet confessionals. And again, if you don't know what it is, don't worry. Um, you'll get a better idea as this lecture goes on. And you can always check out the website. So it says, if you feel down, get help! Exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. You know how in the business... We talk about people that bring their pet in for coughing for eight months. Don't be depressed and wait for it to go away. Your absence will devastate someone. Don't let it get to that point. Seek help, professional help, and find joy in something else, please. I just love this secret because it's so true. Like every, I swear, every shift I almost work, like at the ER, we're always like, oh, so just happened yesterday, huh? Oh, just came up like um, a few days ago. Oh, hasn't been eating for three weeks. Wow. Why did they, you know, we, I know for a fact on a daily basis, we make comments like that in the biz. So just keep that in mind. Maybe turn the mirror to yourself and take a look and see if you're doing the same thing. And that's really hard to look at, um, especially when you're struggling. So don't worry if you can't do it, but just think about it. So in the beginning of this lecture, I am going to get into some definitions, which depending on how nerdy you are, can be kind of boring. Uh, but 
very necessary regardless. So I just want you to think about briefly what psychological trauma means to you before I go ahead and dive into these definitions. Anyway, moving on. So now that you've had a little bit to think about it, I am going to go ahead and give you the definitions. Just so you know, you can always look these up online or in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders, the DSM-5, which is where I got these definitions from. Now, if there is an updated version since I made this video, I do apologize. I will try and keep things up to date as best as I can, uh, but it's a good reference, and it's what mental health professionals, psychologists, psychiatrists, doctors use to diagnose um, mental health issues or diseases um, for insurance purposes, but also for classification reasons, and that's pretty much all you need to know right now. So I'm just going to start with the basics, which are primary stress injuries. Primary stress injuries include acute stress, and it is the most common form of stress. It's short-term, um, doesn't have enough time to do extensive damage associated with long-term stress, and the most common symptoms are from these categories, emotional distress, muscular problems, stomach, gut, and bowel problems. And you can see on the slides, there is a little bit exp expansion on what that can look like. And our three main stress emotions are anger, anxiety, and depression. However, emotional distress can manifest as muscular problems, as physical problems, and I will get more into the science of that in later lectures, but for the purposes of this initial lecture, um, we're going to keep moving along. Acute stress disorder is also known as ASD and is the initial psychological reaction to witnessing or experiencing psychological trauma. The DSM characterizes ASD by the fulfillment of certain criteria, principally A, having experienced intense fear, helplessness, or horror in response to a traumatic experience, B, displaying three or more of the following dissociative symptoms listed below, and C, exhibiting at least one symptom from each of the following groups. The main important thing to remember here as you read through the definition is that significant distress or functional impairment that persists for a minimum of two days to a maximum of four weeks If the duration exceeds four weeks, then it's no longer considered ASD and PTSD is diagnosed. So just understand that it's the precursor to PTSD, but we can go through lots of traumas and never actually develop PTSD um, or lots of acute stress type situations. And that doesn't mean you're traumatized. You know, everyone says like, oh, I'm so, I was so traumatized because like, everyone was singing better karaoke than I was. And I realized what a bad singer I was, you know, no, you weren't traumatized. You were just, um, embarrassed or uncomfortable or intimidated or, um, having imposter syndrome or maybe out of practice, you know? So unfortunately the word trauma does get thrown around, um, without actually being clear on what it is. So psychological trauma is a complicated definition, and maybe that's why people just say, like, oh, everything's traumatizing. Um, but really, I want to emphasize that it is a traumatic episode that's defined as a direct personal experience of an event that involves actual or threatened death or serious injury or other threat to one's physical integrity, or witnessing an event that involves death, injury, or a threat to one's physical integrity, or of that of another person, 
or learning about an unexpected violent death or serious harm or threat of death or injury experienced by a family member or other close associate, maybe even someone you don't even know. And the second prerequisite is that the survivor must have experienced intense fear, helplessness, or horror following the event. If this is a really important if, because if you don't experience intense fear, helplessness, or horror following the event, there's a highly likely chance that you will not um, experience the effects of psychological trauma. And both clinicians and researchers have criticized that both these requirements are necessary, and this is still an ongoing discussion. So just keep in mind, it's not hard and fast rule. Because there is a trauma dilemma, there is a debate over what constitutes a traumatic event, and um, some think that it's like too narrow of a definition and doesn't really include other people who could be traumatized and other researchers argue that the definition is too broad and all of a sudden like everyone's traumatized from less threatening events but ultimately trauma is trauma and if your body and mind experience it as traumatic then it counts that's the main important thing that the takeaway from this slide but just know that it can be confusing and people are still in debate over what constitutes trauma and what doesn't. So let's get to the basics, just differentiating between primary and secondary trauma. Primary traumatic stress happens directly to you. If you can't cope, you develop post-traumatic stress disorder, typically after the timeline of about four weeks after the event. Um, again, not hard and fast rules. Ultimately, like some definitions, some timelines need to be placed in order for diagnoses to happen, yet this is an ever-evolving field, and tomorrow they could change the definitions and publish a new edition of a DSM. Um, and again, the DSM isn't like <laughs> the end-all be-all. It's something humans created in order to try and categorize different mental health disorders so they can better understand them. Secondary traumatic stress is observed by you, but is happening to someone else, also known as vicarious trauma. You don't have to directly observe it. You could see a video. You could. That's why, like, their like child censorship for violent things and stuff like that, because it can all affect you. If you can't cope, you can develop secondary traumatic stress disorder, aka, AKA compassion fatigue. I did not know that compassion fatigue was secondary stress disorder, uh, secondary traumatic stress disorder, sorry, until I was doing more research on compassion fatigue. And I was like, wow, we have been talking about compassion fatigue even in school for years. And literally nobody has brought up that this is trauma. <sighs> that was a very eye-opening realization. And that was probably about seven years ago. And it made me realize, like, I need to know what this is. I need to dive deeper. Like, this, this is affecting me. It affects my life. I don't know enough about it to be able to handle it. So that's ultimately how my journey began, was just being curious and being like, what's this? How come I don't know about this? <laughs> so. And now I'm here trying to share it with y'all so you don't have to spend as much time and energy as I did. And I'm just giving you the cliff notes. Um, so primary trauma examples outside of vet med could be like traumatic accidents, death, rape, sexual assault, war, violence, and even neglect falls into a traumatic event, especially with children, um, or growing up like in your household. If you were neglected, it could have been traumatic for you. In vet med, being attacked, bitten by animals, considered primary trauma, uh, being threatened by people or clients, anesthetic deaths or other procedure-related deaths, professional mistakes such as surgical errors or drug overdoses, um, 
And I briefly mentioned uh, childhood trauma with the neglect topic, but I am not getting into the details of childhood trauma, but you just need to be aware that if you do have childhood trauma that is unresolved, um, it it can impact you still to this day. And any additional trauma that you might experience as an adult uh, can be even more intense. It, trauma can become compounded and um, the effects of it can be exponentially greater uh, than if you didn't have childhood trauma. Um, nowadays, one in four Americans are thought to have had some level of childhood trauma. Um, there is a study online that you can do um, to determine if you aren't sure if you had childhood trauma or not. And I just don't have enough knowledge or time to get into uh, childhood trauma. It's not my area of expertise necessarily, but it is considered to have a severe impact on the brain because it occurs during developmental stages. So it is often treated differently and um, might have just different approaches to uh, resolving it. But then again, it may not. So we'll just leave it at that. Something you can look into. Here is another example from the Vet Confessionals Project. It says, I was badly bitten, broke my hand. Now when a dog growls, I have a panic attack. The importance of noticing what's written here is that this person had a traumatic event, potentially traumatic or acutely stressful event happened to them. Um, it was certainly physically traumatic, but often we forget about emotionally if something is traumatic. And just because something was physically traumatic does not necessarily always mean that emotional trauma will accompany it. Now when a dog growls, I have a panic attack. That is an exaggerated response, probably interfering with the ability of this individual to do their job. Um, normally, yes, if a dog growls, you should be concerned. <laughs> they are indicating to you that they are potentially going to attack you. So at work, let's say you would probably want to get some drugs, get a muzzle, um, change your approach, but having a panic attack would um, make you unable to think clearly, unable to perform your job effectively and throw yourself into a tailspin. And imagine if that happens every time a dog growls, you're not going to last long in that job um, unless you find some way to heal it, to recover from it, to move past it. A note on secondary trauma, it is also known as observed trauma or mirror mirroring. Um, still a controversial topic here with how it occurs. Um, it is thought that it is through something we have called mirror neurons. Uh, mirror neurons are thought to be linked to empathy and how we respond when we witness something traumatic since they light up on brain imaging studies. However, it's still very much like being researched and we definitely need more information. But just you can think of it like even though an event isn't happening directly to you, like when you witness it happening to another being or another person, it can give the same emotional response as if it was happening to you. Not only emotional, but even physical, physiological, or neuro neurobiological. And mirror neurons can also have positive effects, so it's not just for when you witness something negative, it's also for when you're witnessing good things or happy things. It can have that effect on you, even though it it is not you directly that it's happening to. For instance, like watching puppies play or dogs play, um, 
And if they're having a great time, you could be like, wow, this is like so fun. Even though you're not the one playing, you're just watching them having fun. This is a Instagram post that was a comment that was left on the previous post uh, that said about the dog, the person getting bit by the dog. And this one says, doctor was being mauled in the room and I was at the far end of the hospital on the microscope. Still get shakes if there is a loud noise and I am at the scope. <clears throat> so just think about briefly what this might be representing. It basically does on some level, now I'm not diagnosing this person, but it does on some level indicate that this person may have experienced some level of secondary trauma or secondary stress or vicarious trauma. Um, even though they weren't the one who was mauled, they now have a re-experiencing that is occurring when there is a loud noise and they're at the location that they were at when a very traumatic thing was happening to someone else that is their colleague. So just interesting that this person noted it and they probably are pretty well aware of what's going on since I do post about trauma on the Instagram page. People are pretty informed that follow that page about what might be going on. So really appreciated that example because we do see a lot of traumatic stuff happening in our jobs. And this is a picture of a cat that was burned in a house fire. This is hard. It's sad. But we have to, you know, especially in the ER, it's just like churning, coming in through the door left and right traumas. And we have to be there to help them. But we're also witnessing uh, and perhaps taking on some vicarious trauma through our profession. And it's not just witnessing animals suffering. It's also witnessing people suffering, children. But the reason we do it is because we love to see them go home happy and healthy and live a good life despite whatever emergency or health problem is happening. And normally I would insert the Lion King song here, but for copyright reasons, I don't think I can. So just imagine it playing in your head. And the house burn kitty, house fire kitty went home happy and healthy, looking like a lemur or like Simba. <laughs> So the good news is that there are new discoveries happening all the time because of advances in brain imaging studies. And we know so much more about how the brain responds and recalibrates to trauma and traumatic events than we did even 10 years ago, even 20 years ago. And it is actually really a hopeful field in that like there's still so much to discover um, trauma does produce actual physiological changes including recalibration of brain's alarm system which I'll get into and an increase in our stress hormone activities and alterations in the systems that filter relevant inf information from irrelevant Trauma compromises the brain area that communicates the physical embodied feeling of being alive. And it's important to note that behaviors that are a result of trauma are not the result of moral failings, lack of willpower, or bad character. They are caused by actual changes in our brain. These changes were meant to protect us. It they aren't meant to hurt us necessarily, but what happens is over time, it can hurt us. And I'll get more into that as we progress. Great, so far technology is working with me. <laughs> it's important to understand when it comes to symptoms of trauma that not everybody reacts the same way. Some can have speechless horror. Some don't. 
I will get into all these. This is just like a little preview of the different symptoms of trauma, and we will go through each one over the course of the next slides. <clears throat> okay, but I'm going to stop here and take a break, um, and I'll be back. So I think that's enough information for now, and if you just want to take a break and think about or journal a little bit, now is your chance, and I'll see you soon. Bye.